what a delight to see so many here this afternoon. Uh, I'm sure an indication of your interest in the topics that we'll be discussing this afternoon. It truly is my delight to be here with you and to update you on the current state of our economy, government's finances, and our future development plans. I do feel an, an apology, somewhat of an apology is, is uh, needed on my, on my part, or I was the reason why we had to postpone it from a few weeks ago, but I'm sure uh, you all understand the reasons for that, and I have to say I'm delighted to be here again this evening, to, this afternoon, to make this a reality. This evening, I think we can all agree that this, after, this afternoon, that the Cayman Islands is currently enjoying an exceptionally robust period of economic activity with solid, sustained growth across all sectors, low and falling unemployment, low to moderate inflation, along with strong and stable government finances that enables us to invest in infrastructure and improving public services while generating operational surpluses and decreasing public sector debt. And ladies and gentlemen, if I said nothing further, you get the picture that I'm going to be painting this afternoon. However, it is necessary for me to, to, to expand upon the things that I've just said. And as a government, government and as a country, we have much today that we can be proud of. However, Cayman's prosperity is hard fought and it is hard won. And this reality is not to be taken for granted. We need to maintain our focus, support our dynamic business community, and take decisions the country needs if we are to continue to prosper in the future. We have taken deliberate steps to create and maintain an environment which encourages investment and innovation, while also ensuring a robust regulatory environment that meets or exceeds globally accepted standards. Our economic success is also a reflection of how well our citizens, residents, and business community engage with each, with each other and participate in the Caymanian economy. Let me just focus on the key relationship between government and business. Our government has set out to reduce the financial and administrative burdens, particularly on small business, in order to make it easier to start up and then grow businesses in Cayman. It was good to see that our efforts are being recognized with the publication last week of a new global competitive complexity in the index, which had Cayman in last place. Recognizing this jurisdiction as the easiest place in the world in which to do business. And I have to say, finally, a league table where we are happy to be at the bottom of the list. Let me turn now to speak of some of the economic indicators and give you, a paint, give you a picture of where the economy currently stands in the Cayman Islands. Our preliminary indicators of economic growth as measured by gross domestic product, or GDP, show that our GDP grew in real terms by 3.4% in 2018, a further improvement on the already impressive economic performance in the previous financial year which saw growth of 3%. Over the last five years, the economy has recorded an average growth rate of 3% in real terms. This is an impressive track record by any standard. And by way of comparison, the GDP growth of 3.4% in 2018 was stronger than the estimated growth of 2.9% for the US and 2.2% average growth for the world's most advanced economies. So far in 2019, all indications are that we are on track to record continued expansion of the Cayman economy. The foundations that we have put in place will continue to provide a platform for growth in the medium term. Solid GDP growth is forecast to continue over the next three years. Included in the, in the 12th of April 2019 presentation, of the government's strategic policy statement, GDP is expected to grow by 2.8% in 2019, 2.2% 2 .2 in 2020, 2.1% in 2021, and 2% 2 in 2022. Now this reduction in the outlook for economic growth in, the peri in this period partly reflects the potential impact 
of lowered growth at projections of the IMF for the USA and advanced economies in general for this time period. With Cayman still projected to achieve growth of 2 to 3 percent against the background of an anticipated global slowdown, it demonstrates the strength and vitality of our economy and of our businesses like those present here today. Growth in 2018 was broad-based across all major industries recording positive expansion. The hotel and restaurant sector recorded the, the strongest in or most robust increases with its gross value added increasing by an estimated 10.6% following an increase of 4.3% in 2017. The strong performance of the sector was driven by improvements in local capacity and additional air passenger routes coming on stream. This reflects the success of the partnership between industry and government and the strategy that has been pursued under the last two administrations. I am sure that there will be a lot more discussion of this in the panel session later this afternoon. The construction sector continued to be a major contributor to growth in 2018, with its estimated value added increasing in real terms by 8.1%. Growth in the sector reflected the infrastructural capacity of the islands keeping pace with the demand for residential, commercial, and public facilities arising from a higher population basis, base, which at, was estimated at over 65,000 at the end of 2018. The financial and insurance services sector, consisting mainly of domestic banking and insurance services, remains dominant in our economy. This industry directly contributes approximately 31% of GDP, and it continues to grow at a steady rate, estimated at 1.8% in real terms in 2018. The business services sector, comprising mainly of legal and accounting services, grew by 4.6% in 2018. This industry is Cayman's second largest sector and directly contributes approximately 13% to total GDP. The industry's performance in 2018 is associated with sharp increases in new company and partnership formations, which rose by 25% and 29.3% respectively. In addition, the number of listings on the stock exchange surged by some 37%. The strength of business activity in Cayman continues to be evident from this data. Despite the blows that are, are being aimed at us internationally, international business confidence remains high, and the government remains absolutely committed in supporting our financial services industry. After two consecutive years of declining consumer prices in 2015 and 2016, the CPI increased in 2017. This increase continued in 2018 peaking at 4.8% in the second quarter and averaging 3.3% for all of 2018. Rising fuel prices in the international market, coupled with higher demand from the increased local population, were the key drivers of inflation during the year. Preliminary consumer price data report for the first quarter of 2019 Re re reveals that consumer prices are up by 4.5% compared to the same period in 2018. This increase is broad-based, with increases being noted across most major categories, most notably in housing and utilities, the index, which is up by 11.1%, communication increased by 7.7%, and recreation and culture up by 4.1%. While rising consumer prices of, are of concern because of the very real impact such increases have on individuals and businesses, it does indicate a high level of activity within our economy. The government will continue to closely monitor the CPI and implement it mitigation strategies wherever it can do so. In the end, though, inflation is a product of market forces, and we need to support the market to readjust to rather, rather than to seeking direct government interference in, to counteract inflationary pressures. 
As Milton Friedman said, inflation is caused by too much money chasing too few goods. Our economic strength and our growing population will continue to put more money into our economy. This is something that I believe we should celebrate and not try to dampen. Therefore, the answer lies in how we can ensure that the supply of goods increases to meet the growing demands of the population. In, the, in my view, this is why we need to give much greater attention to the absolutely vital cargo element of the new port project. I am sure the cruise berthing aspect will be something to be discussed during the tourism panel session, but whatever your views are on cruise tourism, I hope that as business people and business, you will all be able to see why expanded cargo port facilities are an, an essential element of our econ if our economy is to continue to grow and to prosper. Now, strong growth in our economy continues to support increase in the demand for labor. Significant increases in employment in 2018 meant that the overall unemployment rate decreased to 2.8% from 4.9% at the end of 2017. The decline emanated from reductions in unemployment among Caymanians and non-Caymanians alike. Significantly, however, the highest reduction in unemployment was recorded amongst Caymanians, where the unemployment rate fell from 7.3% to 4.6% in 2018. This puts the government well on track to, developing, to, to delivering the commitment we made to achieving full Caymanian employment, an economy where every Caymanian willing and able to work can do so. That achievement, though, stretches back through, the, through to the measures put in place by the last administration. And as a result, some 3,300 more Caymanians are now employed compared to the, the position when back in 2013. The continued positive economic prospects for the Cayman economy mean that the robust employment market in Cayman will continue over the medium term. The new department we have established, Workforce Opportunities and Residency Cayman, will work with businesses to ensure that we match growth sectors with suitably qualified Caymanians, and also that we respond more positively and quickly to those businesses that need to bring in workers where, where there are no suitably qualified Caymanians available to fill those positions. Strong growth means both jobs for Caymanians and a continued need for work permits. It is not either or, it is both. The task we have set for work is to ensure the appropriate balance is achieved that is good for Caymanians, fair to foreign workers, and responsive to changing business needs. Looking now at education, the government also understands it is absolutely necessary that we ensure Caymanians coming into the workforce have the skills to compete in an increasingly global labor market. For this reason, we continue to prioritize investment in education. Perhaps, understandably, it is the investment in new school facilities that grab the headlines. Most notably, the commitment we have made to complete the new John, Ray, John Gray High School. However, while suitable classroom spaces are important, we understand that it is the teaching that goes on in the classroom, from new and old, that makes the biggest difference in raising standards of attainment. Accordingly, we have delivered a significant increase in teachers' pay to help us attract and to retain the best teachers, and the next step will be to begin the transition to a new, more up-to-date and challenging curriculum. Beyond that, the government also plans to introduce a new government arrangement, govern, governance arrangement for Cayman's public schools, and I hope that when the call comes for volunteers to serve on the new governing bodies, that you will take the responsibility for raising, that will take the responsibility for raising the performance of schools, of teachers, and of pupils, we will see many of you and hear from you and in the business community answering that call. Your skills and your commitment 
will be crucial to making these future arrangements work. Government, this government, like the last, has been willing to invest in the vital infrastructure our country needs as it continues to grow. These investments themselves create jobs, support future growth, and deliver improvements to the quality of life for all who live here. Major approved public sector infrastructure projects include the ongoing expansion of Owen and redevelopment of Owen Roberts International Airport, the second phase of which will begin later this year and include resurfacing of the runway and other airside improvements in other airside facilities. The long-term residential mental health facility will enable us to care for some of the most vulnerable in our community here in Cayman rather than sending them overseas for treatment. The new solid waste management infrastructure that will end our unsustainable reliance on landfill, boost recycling, and create a new sustainable energy resource. Procurement of the Georgetown cruise berthing facility and cargo terminal, the Georgetown revitalization project that will bring a new life to the heart of our capital, and ongoing road improvements that I will speak to more ful fulsome shortly. Notwithstanding the public sector projects occurring, growth over the medium term will continue to be driven by the private sector, with recently completed and forthcoming projects that will increase the accommodation capacity for tourism arrivals and boost other commercial activities. Significant new tourism accommodation projects, such as the Grand Hyatt Hotel at the old Pageant Beach site, the Mandarin Oriental Hotel at Beach Bay in Bodentown, and the Curio Collection Hotel by Hilton on North Church Street in Georgetown, are expected to commence construction within the next year, providing further boost to our construction sector while building capacity to facilitate expansion of our tourism sector. In addition, there are several luxury condominium projects that are currently under construction, which are also providing a boost to those two important sectors. Other significant private sector-led real estate development projects that are expected to contribute to growth over the medium term include the continued development at Kamana Bay, including the completion of the new Foster's Food Fair Supermarket, expansion of the CI Cayman International School, effectively doubling its capacity, and the Olea residential development. And there are at least three substantial commercial and residential developments that are slated for the Grand Harbor area. Now turning next to our fiscal strategy, we are committed to the fiscal strategy that we established at the start of our first term in office that was centered on the following three key principles. Compliance with the framework for responsible financial management, no new fees or taxes levied on the public, and no new borrowings. It is this sound, prudent fiscal strategy that has resulted in a significant improvement state, improved state of public finances that I mentioned earlier, and places the government in the best possible position to respond to any potential economic downturn or shock. Government has not borrowed a single dollar since 2012. And where possible, loan balances have been and continue to be repaid ahead of their scheduled maturities. I, be I believe this, this, I believe, is unprecedented by any government in modern times. In November of this year, we have a bond of 312 million US dollars issued in 2009 that matures. And while the bond will be repaid when it matures, it is likely <clears throat> that we will need to refinance a portion of, of it in order to maintain compliance with the principles of responsible financial management. While the amount of the refinance, amount to be refinanced will be determined later this year as we get closer to the maturity date and we see how government's finances perform, I can tell you now that the overall result will be a very significant net reduction in public sector debt. Indeed, by the 31st of December 2019, I expect that with respect to debt obligations other than the bond issue, we will have repaid 183 million CI dollars of debt since May, the 31st of May 2013, when the previous progressives led move, uh, government 
first came to office. Our commitment to reducing debt levels mean that the significant capital investment programs is being funded entirely by surplus cash generated from operating activities. Our financial strategy is right for our country, as it is now. It is appropriate for Cayman's future needs, and it is robust in the face of potential future economic shocks. The best evidence that I can offer you this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, in support of that view is provided by none other than Moody's Investor Services, who, in March 2019, reaffirmed the Cayman Islands AA3 rate sovereign debt rating with a stable outlook. Growing revenues through economic growth, controlling operating and financing expenses, containing, ca cap in containing capital investments and generating substantial cash flows from operating surpluses has enabled government to build and maintain significant cash reserves, a key component of ensuring compliance with the principles of responsible financial management and the framework for fiscal responsibility, which are set out in the public management and finance law. I am probably not giving away any state secrets today when I tell you that as, as politicians, we often come under pressure to use those reserves to fund various public sector investments. However, as I have outlined, the maintenance of sufficient cash reserves is a crucial part of our strategy with an eye on the future. We have all experienced the impact of a natural disaster and of a global economic slump, and robust reserves will give us scope to act when the inevitable future, for future shocks appear. I must therefore pay tribute to my colleagues in the government caucus for their willingness to stick with our fiscal strategy in the face of inevitable demands to increase public spending. These prudent financial measures have resulted in exceptionally positive draft financial results for the 2018 financial year, which ended on the 31st of December 2018. For the 2018 year, central government achieved record operating revenues of 838 million Cayman dollars. That was 107 million more, or 15% greater than our budget. I must stress again that this revenue level was achieved without the government introducing any revenue measures and with various tax reduction initiatives in place for several years now that benefit households and business. And that is a testament to the level of business activity that is taking place within the Cayman Islands at this time. Operating and financing expenditures in 2018 were 669.3 million being 25 million or 3.9% more than budget, resulting in an operating surplus of $169 million. And that was $82 million or 95% more than we budgeted in 2017. Central government's bank balances increased to 559 million at the end of December compared to 462 million at the end of 2017, or an increase of 21%. Our debt management strategy has resulted in the reduction of debt to $420 million at the end of 2018, compared to $577 million at the 31st of May 2013, when the progressives first assumed office. Looking now at 2019's first quarter financial performance, just two weeks ago in the Legislative Assembly, I presented the government's unaudited financial results for the first quarter of the 2019 financial year. These results reaffirm the validity of our fiscal strategy, which continues to yield the desired financial results. In summary, for the first three months of the year, the core government, and that includes statutory authorities and government-owned companies, core government being the ministries, portfolios, and such, they earned total operating revenues of $373.7 million and incurred total operating expenditures of $158 million, resulting in an operating surplus for core government of $215 million. Core government bank balances were a record high of $747 million, and our debt balances stood at $417 million. 
those are a very extreme positive results by any, by any measure. Government's prudent fiscal policies enable us to maintain, establish, and maintain compliance with the principles of responsible financial management during the 2018 financial year. We achieved an operating surplus of 169 million I mentioned. Our net worth was a positive 1.4 billion. Our debt servicing cost, which includes both interest and principal payments, was 8.4% of core government's revenue. Net debt was three, negative 3.6% of core government's operating revenues. This ratio compares debt to the bank balances and the negative 3.6% means that at the end of the year, government's bank balances exceeded its debt for the first time in many decades. Government had sufficient cash reserves at the end of the year to cover 256 days of operating expenditures, and that is significantly greater than the minimum 90-day legal threshold. As I set out in the House in April, we will remain in compliance throughout the next three fiscal year, three forecast budget period, demonstrating our commitment to the long-term position that for the country, that rather than any short-term electoral advantage that might be gained by going on any sort of spending spree. Now, government's operating revenues have been steadily increasing over the years. The importance that we place on having strong management systems to ensure that revenue is com comprehensively collected and cohesively managed in an efficient and effective manner cannot be overemphasized. By successfully managing our existing re revenue streams, government can avoid the need to implement new revenue streams and new revenue measures. Recent improvements include the development and implementation of risk management, internal controls, and performance reporting governance frameworks. The development of policies and procedures surrounding the way in which government processes and approve revenue waiver applications, and also reviewing legislation to ensure that the government is collecting all of the revenue that it is due. You may recall that most recently, a review of the stamp duty law resulted in amendments being made to close a loophole that had developed over the past few years whereby persons were buying condominiums or apartments, homes, pre-construction from developers and were paying stamp duty on land only and not on the value of the development when completed as it was intended by the law. Of course, you will be aware that the stamp duty changes was also about increasing the, daily, the, the duty thresholds for the first time Caymanian home buyers, providing no to low stamp duty on the purchase of property. This change helps put some, put some home ownership within the reach of many more young Caymanians and their families. That in turn is but one plank of our overall strategy to improve access to housing for Caymanians. Another has been to work in support of the National Housing Development Trust as it reconstructs affordable homes for hardworking Caymanians. 30 such homes have been or are being built and the trust is continuing to expand its activities. In addition, recent finance committee, at the recently concluded Finance Committee of the Legislative Assembly, we agreed to an additional allocation of 1.6 million to fund repairs that will bring back to a, a habitable condition the homes of several of our elderly, disabled, and those with young children whose properties are, were da are damaged, often for reason outside of their own control. Turning now to future development plans, government is committed to working with the private sector to ensure long-term sustainability of a flourishing economy, whilst also preserving the unique qualities that make him at the Cayman Islands such a wonderful place to live, work, visit, and to do business. In his strategic policy statement on the 2020 to 21 budget, our premier outlined how the government intends to address the growth of the islands in a planned and sustainable manner that will ensure the best use of available land while preserving our unique environmental heritage. The Plan Cayman Development Framework, which has now completed its first round of public consultation, will focus on one major land area at a time 
thereby covering the entire island over a five-year period and then restarting at the beginning. This rolling approach makes for a workable continuous planning review process. A plan is now being developed for the Seven Mile Beach Corridor and will include looking at the merits of the development of taller buildings and mixed-use developments that could ease both commercial and residential demands. And this will dovetail with the work on the Georgetown Revitalization Project that is now being driven forward by the, de the dedicated town manager. Both of these areas of work will be delivered in close consultation with both residents and local businesses. And I hope you will continue to be engaged in that work as many of you here were in the first, uh, helped in the first round of Plan Cayman consultation. The area-based approach is being com complemented by work to tackle some of the key long-term issues that will impact communities right across our islands. The most pressing of those is the ongoing need for infrastructure improvements, and the most pressing issue within that is the need to tackle congestion on our roads. Much to the relief, I am sure, of those of, for those of you who live east of Grand Harbor, Premier announced in April that the government is responding to the worsening traffic congestion in those areas and intends to reprioritize road improvements over the next two years in order to address the traffic issues. Road improvements will include extending the east-west arterial road to the northward and then to Baden Town. We are also initiating projects around Grand Harbor and westward into Georgetown to ensure traffic can move more smoothly. Work will be underway before the end of this year. Just building more roads is not a long-term solution given the projected population increases for Cayman. And therefore, the Plan Cayman project will also look at alternative transport solutions as a safer site, such as a safer cycling and walking routes and a radical and new approach to public transport. We will be commissioning a specialist mass transit study that will analyze the options available for us to achieve the necessary change in public transport that the country so desperately needs. The study will be completed within a year so that we will be able to consult widely and draw up detailed plans for inclusion in the next strategic policy statement. The creation of the National Energy Policy by the last administration set ambitious but achievable goals to move Camp Cayman to a more sustainable pattern of energy generation and consumption. We are currently implementing several important actions, including greater use of electrical vehicles and increased use of renewable, renewables in government buildings. There are also plans to encourage the public to purchase electric, electric and hybrid vehicles. By way of an, an, an update, the UK government recently issued its response to the Foreign Affairs Committee report entitled Global Britain and the British Overseas Territories that made sweeping recommendations on registers of beneficial ownership, same-sex marriage, and UK citizens' rights to vote and hold office in British Overseas Territories. Government is pleased with the UK government's recent response that it is committed to developing a positive and constructive relationship with its overseas territories and that it has no intention of interfering with locally determined franchise and representational arrangements. With regard to the public registers of beneficial ownership, government has, the government, UK government has committed to following a consultative process and not accelerating the current timetable to implement public registers in advance of the year, end of the year 2023. Our government has made it absolutely clear that Cayman will continue to resist any attempts by the UK government to impose public registers in the, in, a, in the absence of a global standard. This is not because we want to see any illegal money laundering or activities taking place through Cayman's financial institutions. We do not need, nor do we want, that type of business. Rather, it is about keeping a level playing field in the global market. In short, if and when it becomes the global standard, we will comply. Ladies and gentlemen, the Cayman Islands is continuing to benefit from a strong, resilient economy that has weathered many challenges. Our future success depends on our ability to adapt and innovate 
and as a government and business leaders, we all have a responsibility to, the, to do everything that we can to ensure the continued success of these islands. Our government is committed to exercising prudent and responsible financial management, improving both the physical and institutional infrastructure, infrastructure capacity necessary to facilitate economic development in a sustainable and appropriate manner that enhances the quality of life for our residents. We have also shown our willingness and ability to move forward with necessary infrastructure projects, including our expanding road infrastructure, a modern landfill project, an expanded cargo dock and cruise berthing facility to the long needed improvements at the airport. The benefit, these benefit all who live here as well as supporting the growth of business. It is the private sector that is the engine of our future economic growth and that is so critical to maintaining our long-term success. Over the past six years, I believe government and business have come more closely and worked more closely together to support growth. There is, though, more to be done. And I look forward to working with you, President Kirkconnell, the Chamber Council, and the wider business community as we work in partnership to achieve our shared ambitions for Cayman. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the forum and your afternoon. Ms. Taggart, if you could join President Kerkernel on the stage there, we're going to have a question and answer period. But before we move into that stage, just want to notify everyone here that a couple of you are parking in some areas which uh, the people have requested that you remove your vehicles. It's a person that's parked on Rally Key Street and inside Foster Bay Villas. There's a road going to Tiki Beach as uh, well. So there is parking available on that road. So if your car is down there, I hope it won't be towed. So you probably need to move it if you are parked near Rally Key or inside, inside Foster Bay Villas. So while they're preparing themselves to get on stage, what I'm asking everyone to do now is really just go ahead and start writing your questions down, any questions you may have for the minister. This is incredible access to a sitting member of cabinet, particularly the one who actually has the purse strings and, and pays the bills and earns the revenue. So if you have any pressing questions that you'd like, uh, President Kerkernel right now will, will probably engage in a conversation. So we have about a half hour conversation. So again, if you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll be happy to, to grab it from you. So take it away, Chris. Thank you, Will, and um, thank you, Minister uh, McTaggart, for joining us today and for all that fantastic information and the insight into the, st the state of our finances with the government and the state of the economy. Um, the first question would really just to be, where do you see Cayman and, and our, our economy, especially the government finances, for the next five years? I think certainly for over the medium term, uh, that is a two to three year time horizon. We think that uh, we see that we see that the economy will continue to grow and that things will, will still remain fairly robust. All of that is predicated on, I think, to a large degree on what you what might happen internationally. But we have seen within our own communities that, that and within the country itself, we are able to, to supplement and, and and grow our GDP with the, de the robust development that is taking place as well. So, you know, while we are very much affected by international events, you know, we can generate, are, are capable of generating growth, and we are seeing that. I think, you know, the construction sector is, is set to continue for the next three to five years, and I think that that will provide a very strong stabilizing force and give us a base to, to continue to grow and to, to sustain any, you know, any economic downturn that, that might come internationally. So uh, beyond the three years, things tend to get a little bit cloudy because you, you, you just, it's difficult to see that far out. Um, but certainly we think certainly this year, next year, and into 2020, 2021, things look very positive. That's great to hear. Um, looking more specific to, specifically to the financial industry, uh, being the top earner for the GDP of the country, um, do you see this uh, being such as in the same robust 
uh, increases that we've seen recently, and what areas do you see as threats, and what areas do you see that we can target to supplement the financial industry and hedge our reliance on any current models for future planning? Well, it goes without saying, you know, the financial services industry is the biggest part, uh, biggest segment of our economy. Um, you know, we, we, it provides, you know, by, by some measures, we say it, it provides about 15% of our, of our GDP, 50% of our GDP. Yet still, the, the, um, the amount of resources it consumes um, is, is relatively small. So it's such an important element to government of the overall, you know, stability and growth of our country that it cannot be underestimate. We cannot underestimate the need for us to preserve and to protect it in every every way that we can. Now we all, I think, are quite familiar with the the, the international challenges that we face, and you know our decision was you know, several years ago that we we must and we have engaged with with those uh, with those in, those who are responsible for those initiatives in an effort to try and negotiate and to, to have the best outcome that will ensure the continued success of the Cayman Islands. And I think we have made strong pro progress. But the, the sad reality, the reality is that the world is changing. And we see these continued burdens of, of increased, you know, uh, compliance being required that are just, you know, heaping a lot of costs on top of businesses. And the challenge, I think, for particularly for the financial or services industry is to be able to, to find a way to absorb those costs because, trust me, we're not, we're not doing this deliberately. I mean, we want to comply, but, uh, you know, a lot of things are being uh, thrust upon us that we're not able to influence uh, in a very positive way in terms of, you know, keeping costs under control. Thank you for that. Um, right before we started the session, you and I were talking a little bit of the impact that we see starting from economic substance and uh, the legislator that is that is being imposed. Um, initially, I think everybody had a very mixed reaction. Which way will this go? What will we see the effect on, on, on the Cayman Islands and our economy? Um, what you've said is that recently, or we're starting to see that there is a positive impact rather than it being a perceived threat that may have been the initial reaction. Yeah. Uh, what are you seeing in various um, in the various industries, various uh, divisions, and what can you um, can you share with us? Yeah, well, I think I, I what I shared with you when we had the discussion earlier was I, well, I personally I was very I was scared when I first saw it and didn't understand it, didn't know what it meant, but I think over time I've come to appreciate now that certainly the you know substan substantive presence issue is one that is, it's now become a global standard. And what I see here is a tremendous opportunity for Cayman because our competitiveness has not waned in any way or been degraded in any way. All of the things that make Cayman popular that have driven our financial services industry over the year, they remain intact. There is no advantage to anyone wanting to do business to leave Cayman to go and set up in, in a competitive jurisdiction um, because there, there, though there, there are no real advantage that, didn't, that exist now that didn't exist before this uh, substantive presence issue came to place. So what I am, we are starting to see are businesses looking to set up a substantial presence here in Cayman. And I believe that that will continue. And I think you know, that bodes well, I think, for future economic activity as well in the country. Uh, leading f from that, um, seeing that housing and utilities were one of the largest uh, growth areas as far as yeah. cost of living um, and one of the largest impacts, uh, a lot of our member businesses are finding huge, almost a crisis in the cost of living and the cost of, especially for employees. Uh, affordable housing, mid-range housing is, you know, is becoming a, a serious problem for a growing economy. We see a lot going on. What, what do you think are measures that can be put in place by government to incentivize uh, construction, not only in luxury retail, but in, in construction that will help to house the working class? Yeah. Well, there are a number of, of, of projects that are taking place right now um, where, um, you know, that are, are, are targeting the, the, the um, 
middle to lower, lower middle income segment of the employment market in Cayman. In addition, you have the work of the Housing Development Trust. I mentioned that they've got 30 houses under, either under construction or about to be under construction. We just bought some land in Georgetown as well, several many acres of land which to construct homes as well, geared to that segment of the marketplace. So government is responding, and I think we, we are seeing the private sector developers as well who are targeting and building homes for that area. The issue we have right now is that there, the demand is great and the supply has not yet caught up with the demands that exist. And so that is the reason why you're seeing you know, your, uh, your rents going out, you know, increasing so highly. The other aspect that you are seeing develop in Cayman is the growth of the Airbnb type. And we're seeing people, on condominium and apartment owners, taking their, their, their inventory out of the local rental market and turning it into an Airbnb. And that is, is having a constraint as well on the availability of, uh, of inventory in, in the rental market as well. So a number of things taking place that, uh, that are contributing to the higher cost of, of, of housing. Do you think that there's, as you mentioned uh, in, in your presentation, it, one of the biggest focuses is to make sure that private sector is helping to fund a lot of these needs, needs and having to fill um, the demand for a lot of these markets. Is there anything that you can see the government would be willing to consider? I know that we've seen concessions on a lot of larger developments. Uh, could anything be considered for affordable housing and, and things that, could, that could, could be put in place to spur that type of development? Well, I would say government would be open to, to, to any suggestions. I mean, one of the things I know that is contributing as well and helping in the real estate market uh, are, are the amendments that we made with the stamp duty law to allow first-time Caymanian buyers to acquire, um, you know, to acquire their home free of uh, stamp duties or, or a very low percentage of stamp duty. And we have seen, a very, I think, a very significant response to it in that the, the market there and the applications are, are quite robust. Uh, for people coming in into the marketplace. What we saw prior to it, to, to making the amendments, was that the availability, the, 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 the availability of housing at the price point level, um, very people, there was very little available. And so Caymanians, first time buyers, were, were finding it difficult to find something in that price range to, in order to acquire a first home. And it is, literally, it is for your first land or, or ho house acquisition. So if you don't qualify the first time around, you basically you're out of luck uh, in the future unless we amend things. Uh, there's plenty of questions out in the audience, so thank you very much for those, uh, Minister. Uh, we'll start with data protection. This is a question that came out, and it says, is the data protection law on schedule for later this year? The short answer is yes. As to my knowledge, I have heard nothing to the contrary, uh, Will. Um, it certainly, I think it's September or December. September. Uh, yeah, whatever the time frame is, that is still on target. Another question about your, the budget generally and about the debt um, from, a, from somebody in the audience. When we are planning to end um, the 2019 with, we're planning to end 2019 with $559 million after pay down, part of the debt. Why can't uh, be paid down all of the debt rather than paying 5% interest and earn 2% interest on government funds? Are you considering any other options to the debt? Yeah, well, I, I think I, if I said so, it wasn't my intent to convey, convey that government, we were ending 2019 with, with 500 million in, in cash. That's not, that's not projected to be the case. Um, we will be far closer to the, that 90 day level of, of uh, of resources uh, of cash reserves because you know my goal really is to see that we pay down as much of this debt as possible will if I could I'd love to be able to tell you here this afternoon that we're going to pay down 100% I would love to do it because over the 10 years we have paid 180 million dollars US to service that debt mm -hmm. think of what we could have done with a another 180 million dollars so I would love to see us pay, we are going to pay down as much of it as we can. However, in 2017, the, the, um, 
the Legislative Assembly gave us authority to borrow up to $150 million in order to refinance a portion of it. And, you know, I, I think with government's finances performing the way that they have been, we are going to pay down more than, than what we had previously budgeted. And so at the end of the day, you want, we, we're going to do it, but still do it responsibly and make sure we still comply with, uh, can comply with the, uh, with the framework that we have to operate under. There have been some changes in legislation according to this question regarding stamp duty paid on land, uh, regarding land and condominium purchases. And they're just asking whether the government will see a significant loss in revenue when that change really hits, comes into being. So right now with development, you know, you, you can separate land and the cost of the condo. I guess it's a, you know, I'm not sure if I'm explaining the question right, but it's regarding stamp duty and whether you're forecasting a reduction in stamp duty uh, when those new changes come to effect. We're not forecasting any uh, um, reduction in stamp duty. Um, the, we, what we see is that you know, the, the, the market is particularly robust. What I think you're, you're getting to is, is when, we, when the ability for people, these, these uh, projects to be sold um, you know, free of stamp duty uh, and to, to, to avoid it, which I think it, it, it ends on December 31st of this year for all intents and purposes, but only for, um, for developments that have been approved by the end of June. Um, but we're not seeing any indications at all, certainly at this point, that that, it, that is likely to result in, in any, um, any reduction in, in revenues to the government. Um, you know, the, the, the practice of, of avoiding it is something that's crept in, in in the last, you know, I would say within the last 10 years. And it was not being used, Will, uh, by, by everybody. Mm -hmm. There were many developers there who saw and knew, knew what was being done, but who felt and knew that that was not the intention of the law and refused to do it and, so, or engage in it. But, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we, we don't think it will have a material impact on, on uh, the real estate market. As you can imagine, there are several questions about the cruise berthing and, and cargo facility. So I know we have the acting premier with us, and when we get to that panel, some of those questions will be asked. So I'm going to deal mainly with the questions that deal with your ministry and responsibilities in the budget. So it says here, one of the questions is, when the government debt is gone, do, does, would government consider building a sovereign wealth fund or reduce fees or taxes on business or the people? <laughs> um, there is always scope for that. When you, when you look at, the, if we can get the debts paid down, <laughs> Um, then certainly, I mean, you know, if, if uh, there are all sorts of, sorts of op options available to, to any government to, uh, to give, you know, uh, tax relief as well as spend additional money for, inf for other infrastructure projects that are needed. So to me, all things are, are still there. I mean, we stay within our, our, our government, we, we do from time to time look when we're preparing the budget, are there, is there any scope for us to... Uh, to, to make adjustments to our, our revenue streams. And we do have those discussions and, and, and healthy discussions about things. Um, but we, you know, the, the concessions that were given in, in previous years are still relevant and continue to, uh, you know, to, to, to help and to, to uh, you know, help the, the income of, uh, of everyone. So another question, again, it's not necessarily your ministry, but I'm assuming Cabinet speaks about these things. And it's basically dealing with the Hurley's Roundabout and the plan, the infrastructure road plan. They kind of want to get a sense as to, you know, how is that going to be addressed in terms, because again, I think it goes back down to the productivity of the people, the amount of time and traffic, and, and a, a lot of people are getting increasingly frustrated by the bottlenecks from the east. Yeah. Well, it is, it is one of our top priorities when it comes to the, the road infrastructure in the country right now. Uh, we all see, we all know the issue. I know that Minister Hughes' ministry is working assiduously to develop those plans. They, I could, what I can say here is that those plans have not yet made it to the cabinet for consideration and approval, but they are being worked on and, and you know, the intention is that the work will begin on some of that stuff this, 
this summer, actually, in a, with the intention of, of having things completed as quickly as possible. It's not going to alleviate the problem completely. This is, you know, fairly, it's a very multifaceted um, issue that we have to deal with here. And the question is, is achieving the right balance? Because, you know, we have to look at the number of cars on our roads. Um, and we just cannot continue to build roads to accommodate the every increasing you know, number of cars that are coming out onto the island. So that's why I said we are looking to at, at the public transportation system because that is sorely needed throughout the country. But it's got to be one that is going to be reliable and, uh, and one that is affordable for, for the citizens. Uh, so lots of things being considered here in addition to just that infrastructure. But it, it, I promise you it's actively being worked on. So a question about the financial services industry, and it says, with the industry growing at less than 2%, are we actually losing market share in the global economy? And what should the government enact for pro-business reg regulations to maybe reverse that trend? You said growing at less than 2%? It says here, the question reads, with the industry growing at less than 2%, are we losing market share in the global economy? Yeah, well, when we talked about the, the less than 2%, the 1.8% um, that growth that I was showing you, that was in the domestic marketplace. Um, financial services itself is, is, is growing, growing quite strongly because you have to take in the, uh, you know, the legal and the accounting aspects of it when, in order to get a better picture. And that growth of four point, I think it's 4.5% that we had for 2018, that was substantially in excess of, I think it was like 1.8% overall in, of the industry in 2017. You know, it was very, been very anemic uh, for, you know, for several years. And then we've seen a very significant upturn in 2018. So I, I, I don't believe that the figures on, on a grand basis, on a total basis, would support that we're losing market share. We still seem to, we, we are still a destination of choice, and we still continue to lead a lot of the rankings. Um, I, I, I haven't, we don't see any significant downturn. In fact, you know, gave you the statistics with regard to the record increase in, in corporations last year, record increase in, in listings on our stock exchange, all point to a very robust industry. Well, it, again, I'm going to dabble into that cruise birthing and cargo question. Cause I and I'm going to dodge it. <laughs> 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 but it's not a direct question, so I, I think the acting premier can probably help us more along these lines. But this is just a kind of a finance question. And this is the person as they, as they wrote their question. It seems clear, based on forecast population growth and rising CPI, that increasing capacity and upgrading the cargo port is necessary. However, is coupling a cruise berthing facility with this objective necessary? So wearing your hat, what, what are the advantages of coupling them or not coupling them? To me, the, the, the answer in terms of coupling is that, you know, that area is a working port. It's the only place designated in this country as a port. And every country has got to have one, Will. Um, it seems logical to me that, that uh, to, to, um, to if, if they can be continued to be accommodated there to do so um, and not seek to disturb or to destroy, any other areas of, uh, of the, the country in terms of, you know, the natural resources. Now you, you go anywhere else, they, you know, to me, the environmental impacts far exceed, it'll be far more, to me, damaging. Now, I mean, any development, you know, that there, there are going to be um, environmental impacts, that, that's always the case, but it's about achieving the right balance for me. And this will be the final question because we'll move into the next part so we stay on time. So this is about going green. They said, what, if any, incentives are there in place to encourage businesses to become more sustainable in terms of single-use plastic ban and other things, maybe some strategies that the government may be considering? Well, what can be done? I mean, that, that initiative is, is being led by the Ministry of Environment, by Minister Seymour. Uh, we, are we have turned our attention to it, and we will be 
um, in, in the coming months, we are going to be putting together a group to look at this in a, as a way of trying to see what can be done to limit the use and of uh, single-use plastics in the country. We are we, we're fully aware of, of all the issues. Man, we see it everywhere, uh, everywhere you turn, um, particularly on our shorelines with what's washing up and, and the amount of single-use plastics that we consume in this, uh, in this country as well. Um, so it's, it's an issue that is clearly for, forefront in our minds and we are going to, to work to develop uh, you know, some plans for it. Well, Chris, I'll toss it back to you. Um, I think we're about out of time for this panel session. So thank you, Minister, for your, for your honesty and great questions from the audience, by the way. So I keep them coming for the next panels. So really, we're just, um, just to wrap up, thank you again for joining us for today. I think we all enjoyed uh, your presentation and the time that we had to spend with you in a, in a conversation. Uh, thank you again, and we'll, I'll leave it to Will, and we'll move on to the next section. Well, just let me thank you, too, and thank the, uh, and thank the audience for the questions. Uh, it's, to me, it's been very engaging. I thought we were just really kicking it off and getting started. <laughs> Can't we go? <laughs> thank you, though. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>